As many of you know, we in Seattle have the most regressive tax code in the state with the most regressive tax code in the entire United States. We are worse than Mississippi, we are worse than Louisiana, worse than South Dakota, we are the worst in our city and our state. And it is long, long past time for us to right this wrong. This wrong hurts the poorest among us twice. It hurts them because they don't, they pay more taxes than the uber wealthy and the mega corporations. And on top of that, they do not get the crucial and important services and safety net that they most need. And right now that safety net is all that is holding some people um, in place and keeping them alive. And many people, many people are struggling. This is a crisis, it's a human crisis, a health crisis, an economic crisis. I'm in many organizations and many Facebook groups where people are asking for bankruptcy lawyers so that they can declare bankruptcy during this time, either because they're not getting the benefits they need because they are a um, worker who can't get to work because they're taking care of their children. There are many people who are, have just fallen off the ledge and into the abyss and more and more people are following them. And we absolutely, it's our moral and our um, human need to help them. It is our imperative and we are here tonight to be able to move things forward. We are not just demanding of our council members to pass this legislation and to not have cuts and no austerity. Cuts and austerity are not the way to go here. We are offering the solution. Tax Amazon, tax big business is the solution. And so we haven't just come here with a demand of no cuts, tax big business, but there's an actual legislation that has been proposed by council member Sawant and council member Morales, thank you, so that we can go forward and meet our moral obligations in our community. Also, Amazon is making money hand over fist right now. They're racking it in as their people are sometimes dying and getting coronavirus in the warehouse. They are making money and their shareholders are getting more and more money and Jeff Bezos is getting richer and richer. I want to introduce uh, one of the sponsors of the legislation who wrote this legislation and is promoting this legislation, uh, council member Shama Sawant, who Amazon tried to make sure she wasn't reelected and we all worked our tails off to get her reelected because we knew she was here for the people and she is the one who will lead us, her and council member Morales, lead us to be able to care for our environment, have good jobs, and also get people back to work and care for each other during this crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Summer. And thanks to everyone who has joined this District 1, District 6 town hall meeting on the Tax Amazon legislation. And, uh, you know, first of all, congratulations to all the organizers like Summer who have really worked hard to make this together. And, and I think uh, as Nick Jones from my office informs us, we have at least 50 people watching on the live stream, which is extremely important. I'm assuming many of them are District 1 and District C 6 residents, which is really important. And if you are watching on the live stream and you live in Seattle, I, it doesn't matter which district you live in, just let us know which district you live in. We'll, we'll put you in touch with other organizers in that district because really, this is going this if we win anything and we've shown this again and again we are able to win but only on the basis of fighting for what's just as summer was saying and by organizing rank and file community members it's not going to be one on the basis of any one person doing the right thing it's going to be on the basis of whether we build a powerful enough momentum in the grassroots or not and it's just uh, you know the, what's what strikes me about this evening is the historic moment that we are living through. I mean, obviously we are in the middle of this unprecedented pandemic where uh, in the richest country in the history of humanity, over a hundred thousand Americans have died because of coronavirus. I'm not sure how many of those would have been prevented. And then in the, in the middle of all that, we've seen George Floyd saying, I can't breathe and his life being stolen by Minneapolis cops and by a deeply racist, oppressive, and anti-poor and anti-working people system. Uh, and in response to this, it is incredible to see how people are rising up against the injustice. I, you know, to be sober, 
we have a long, long way to go for our movements to get organized powerfully enough to actually bring about the kind of change we need. But there is zero doubt we are at a turning point in our country's history. And our tax Amazon movement is situated in an incredible movement moment because Summer correctly said this is our moral and social imperative. And it contains within itself incredible power because if we win the Amazon tax here, not only will we be able to uh, carry out a massive expansion in social housing and Green New Deal programs, but we know what's going to come after that. We know it will send energy and enthusiasm uh, among working class people in other cities. And that is precisely why big business and the political establishment are so opposed to us. I agree with Summer, this should not be a polarizing issue. But the reason it is, is because we are not going to be able to fund this kind of social housing and Green New Deal expansion without taxing big business and the wealthiest people. And they know that if we win here, it will give us momentum in other cities as well. And that's why we have to rely on our own movement. And that's why I'm excited that we have all these um, uh, constituents of the district, the two districts going to be speaking today, bringing their own voice. And I'm also excited that the executive director of the Economic Opportunity Institute, John Burbank is with us here. And I think he's going to be sharing some really important information that will ground us in why this is crucial. And as Summer said, we are fed up with the regressive tax system. I need hardly talk about the homelessness and affordable housing crisis that has mushroomed at the same time that big banks, corporate developers, billionaire building owners, and property management corporations have made so much money hand over fist. We need social housing and for that we need progressive revenues, but that was before the pandemic. Now you have in the middle of the pandemic, in addition to that, a public health crisis, a jobs crisis, well over 100,000 in Seattle have lost their jobs. And these are people who were already living paycheck to paycheck. So this is a serious crisis and statistics show that the effects of the pandemic are by no means equal or class neutral. It, we know it is disproportionately both from the public health standpoint and the job loss standpoint, it is disproportionately affecting poorest people, working families of color, women led households and children, immigrant community members, you know, basically all the demographics who are already vulnerable before the pandemic. Carrie from District 6 in North Seattle wrote on our petition, I work for UW Medicine and I have seen firsthand what this crisis is doing to even just a fraction of the community while also seeing friends and family losing jobs, income and livelihood. We need real solutions now. You know, and, and the part of the solution that we need is to the unemployment that is now comparable to that during the Great Depression. And uh, you know, so the mathematics is relentless. The unemployment combined with the fact that our taxes are regressive and that most social programs in our city and our state are funded on the backs of working people, that combined with joblessness automatically implies there is now a major budget cratering at the local and state levels. And this is a very important point we have to share with our friends and neighbors and family members, even without creating new housing or funding new Green New Deal programs, we are going to have to fight to tax big business even if we want to just continue the existing social programs for housing, services, education, infrastructure, you name it. So this is not a neutral question. We either fight for and win the taxes on big business and wealthy people, or the alternative is what Mayor Durkin and the political establishment is already signaling towards austerity as if the budget crunch is an act of God. It's not. You can address the budget crunch, but you will need the political will to tax big business, which is not going to come from most of the politicians, we're going to have to get organized for it. But it's either you tax big business and raise progressive revenues, or you go down the austerity route. And let's remember, austerity means austerity is to us working people and working families and the most marginalized, not for the richest households in our city. And so Amazon tax, let's share this widely. Amazon tax is the antidote to austerity, and it will have a historic impact beyond that in addressing uh, the helping to address that we will need more than the Amazon tax, but it will help to address in a big way the crisis of jobs, of the housing affordability crunch that we have, and the climate change goals that we have. Now, the research numbers are phenomenal from City Hall staff. They are estimating based on very credible sources. These are not biased towards socialism in any way. These sources tell us that uh, we are, you know, projecting 
about 34,000 jobs through the social housing and Green New Deal program. We have momentum for this Amazon tax movement. And uh, we know it is as progressive as it could possibly be to tax only the top 2% of businesses and the effective tax rate will come out to be less than 1% of the profits of the richest people. It is not a tax on jobs. It is not a tax on the workers or the employees of these corporations. It will come out of the major shareholders and the owners, the people who pocket most of the profits. And there's real momentum. You know, first of all, uh, you know, the incredible victory won by the working people in Portland, in the Portland area, where uh, overwhelmingly voters approved a tax on big business and on wealthy individuals to address the housing and homelessness crisis. The Economic Opportunity Institute has been talking about this for years. So this is huge news for our movement and we have wind at our back. And do you know why I'm saying this? It's not because I'm a socialist. Danny Westneat, who's an unflinching spokesperson for the ruling class for the Seattle Times, who's not in uh, our tax Amazon fan club, he was forced to concede last week when he wrote that the wind is at the tax Amazon movement's back. And he says, Portland area voters like here were already very pro-tax, but what was revealing about the vote is that polling showed the economic dislocation of the pandemic made voters even more eager than before to go big on paying for social services for the needy. There you go. The most conservative columnist uh, that we, you know, one of the most conservative columnists in our city has, has to concede that there is momentum on our side. We know that there is tremendous support for this idea among working people and community members, you know, all the way from construction workers to physicians and residents at the UW hospital are supporting this effort. People are angry that billionaires are profiteering even in this pandemic, while working people are desperate for sheer survival, sheer survival. Emily from West Seattle's District 1 wrote, I live paycheck to paycheck trying to feed two children and I work in the food industry. I know 97% or more of the industry live paycheck to paycheck like I do. I cannot go two weeks without work, let alone two months. Who knows how long this shutdown of restaurants is going to last. We need help now. So people are making it very clear. It is simply not acceptable that the crisis of capitalism should be put on the shoulders of workers. Workers did not create this crisis and we should not have to pay. Our children, our elderly and other community members should not have to pay. And yet, unfortunately, and this is where our town hall and our movement comes in, and it's the most crucial component of winning this fight, is that despite all these incredible truths about the moment we live in, unfortunately, the city's uh, Democratic Party political establishment, unfortunately, I wish it was different, but it is not. They are still doing the bidding of the wealthiest while they're being forced to couch their objections in progressive sounding rhetoric or other excuses because they do feel the pressure from our movement. And that's why we should feel encouraged. We should, uh, you know, we should not put any blind faith on the political establishment, but we should understand that the movement is doing its job. And I have to say it was really unfortunate that the city council attempted to shut down discussion uh, using legal excuses. And it, it's just incredible the Orwellian excuses they have made basically amounting to saying that we can't have a discussion on this emergency legislation because we are in an emergency. It's, you know, you can't make this stuff up. But the reason they're using these excuses is, as I said, they're feeling pressure from the grassroots and we need to keep that pressure up. And that's why it's so important that uh, you all have organized this town hall. And the other thing that we should, of course, clarify is, you know, last week, a big business led group calling itself the Third Door Coalition announced a proposal and they said that they want to address the homelessness and affordable housing crisis. But the proposal, which is actually a year old and it's been sitting on the shelf for over a year, it's still deafeningly silent and very sparse on details on how they are going to pay for it. And I think we should remember that this is, um, you know, really coming. It's no coincidence that this vague proposal has been dusted and brought back from the shelves precisely at the moment when regular working people are getting organized to win real big business taxes. It's not an accident, it's because of the pressure. And this move harkens back to the 2018 struggle, two years ago when big business and the political establishment formed the so-called one table. You know, Now it's the third door, it, and then it was the one table coalition to distract 
to attempt to distract from our movement. And one table, you know, despite all the promises, didn't come up with any real proposals. You know, we 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 welcome any solid proposal to actually raise progressive revenues. We are absolutely for it, and we think that that will be the result of the movement, but nobody has stopped them from coming up with it, but they haven't yet. And you know, earlier this year, the same political and business elite proposed a very modest tax on businesses uh, in King County, you know, through uh, legislation in Olympia, uh, but only if Seattle were prevented from passing a meaningful tax of our own, basically having a ban of some sort on municipal big business taxes. Now, we, our movement, you know, our tax Amazon movement led by the rank and file made very clear, we support any and every progressive revenue measure. We don't, we don't, we, we don't complain about where it comes from. If any of the other council members or state legislators was to come forward with a proposal, we would support it and we would celebrate it as a victory for the movement that's been fighting for it. But we also made crystal clear, we were and are opposed to any ban on our city's ability to raise progressive revenues and a lot of us went to Olympia, we talked to legislators, we organized actions, and we were able to ensure that no such ban was going to pass. But what really revealed was revealed there is big business showing their true colors, which is that they refused to support any legislation from Olympia. There was a legislation, but they didn't support it, be even a modest one, because they could not get the real thing that they wanted. The real price that they were seeking was a ban on Seattle's movements, and they didn't get that. And so for me, the this highly publicized launch of third door coalition feels like deja vu. Uh, but again, as I said, let me make it clear again, we support any progressive tax on big business. We welcome any serious proposals, but it would be a serious mistake for our movement if we didn't recognize this, uh, this third door coalition for what it is, which is uh, something that big business has put together, you know, brought back, they had put together uh, this together a year ago, they brought back because they feel the pr pressure from our movement. Let's not forget that one of the main promoters of the third door coalition is Howard Wright, who gave $25,000 to the big business campaign against the 2018 Amazon tax, which was then followed by the shameful repeal by the majority of the city council. So, you know, uh, you may not agree with me, but I'm not holding my breath for them, people like Howard Wright to come up with a progressive big business tax. But if they do, that'll be a real victory for the movement. But in the meanwhile, I believe our strategy is very clear. Uh, we have to absolutely keep building our movement because if anything comes out of the third door coalition, it will be because of the pressure they feel from ordinary people fighting for their rights. And that's why tonight is an important opportunity for discussing that and I wanted to share also the thoughts from Andrew from District 6 who wrote, when will the richest man and the corporation on the planet pay their fair share? Taxation is the only way for that to happen. Amazon has maintained its level of profit on the backs of the working class and that imbalance needs to be rectified. And I will add that there are other corporations, you know, roughly 800 corporations would be taxed under our proposal. They are not all Amazon, but they are all cash rich big business so let's be clear about that it's not no small business is going to be taxed in fact as i said 98 percent of small businesses businesses overall are not going to be taxed which by definition implies all small and medium-sized businesses and even some large businesses uh small nonprofits are exempted automatically all grocery stores are exempted and all public institutions are exempted so uh, you know, we 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 have a very strong proposal. We have strong momentum uh, from ordinary people. However, we have to. Uh, what we need is to build this movement even stronger and understand who's on our side and who's not. And um, it's really unfortunate that we don't have the other council members here today. You know, unfortunately, uh, Council Member Lisa Herbold, who uh, declared a progressive tax on uh, businesses most benefiting from this growth is our best option because we already rely heavily upon regressive property and sales taxes that hit everyone equally. I agree with that statement. That was made by Councilmember Herbal to the Guardian on in May 2018. Uh, she voted for the Amazon tax in May 2018, but then a month later, unfortunately, and in my view, shamefully joined with six of the other eight council members in repealing the very modest tax. So. I think we have seen over and over again what happens, even if we agree that uh, council members are progressive, at the end of the day, actions matter. 
words don't matter because pe people's stomachs are not filled uh, with food and they are not housed by kind words from political figures like myself. My obligation as an elected representative is to do the right thing, not just say right, correct sounding things. And that's why, as Samar said, I take my moral uh, imperative seriously. And I know all of us who are on this call, we take our moral imperative seriously, even if many of the politicians don't. And that's why let's keep building this pressure. Let's have an exciting town hall and let's build our next steps uh, coming from that. Thank you. Hi, thank you everybody for being here today. And I wanted to firstly extend solidarity with the people in Minneapolis who are protesting the awful murder of, of George Floyd. Um, so yeah, as Summer said, I'm a resident of D6, a grad student in music ed at UW. I'm currently student teaching and I'm a steward of music in the music department in UAW 4121 and a member of Socialist Alternative. And I agree with what folks have been saying about how we face a triple emergency with the COVID crisis right now, a crisis of public health, of joblessness, and of homelessness and affordable housing. We're here to remind the establishment that our movement is strong and we're not going anywhere and we need to discuss the best way forward. So firstly, to talk about the UAW and union work, the UAW includes over 6,100 graduate and undergraduate student workers at UW and the worker um, and the academic student employees do, you know, lots of work as teachers and, and as researchers that really makes the university run. And the way that their contracts work, they're, they face uncertainty about whether they will be reappointed as teachers or researchers, assistants year by year. And this summer, because of the crisis, many could find themselves without work, without an income, without health insurance, and like many other people in our city, possibly facing eviction. And so a majority of us were already rent burdened, rent burdened with many of us paying over 50% of our income in rent. And, you know, before COVID, we needed these affordable housing options, but this has only made these issues much worse. So that's why the UAW has been involved in phone banking in dropping off ballots as part of Amazon Tax Prime, building for town halls like this one today, on the coordinating committee, and, and a whole host of other contributions to the movement, as well as donating $2,500. And I urge other uh, union members to get involved in the struggle as well. Additionally, I wanted to talk about being a teacher. And as a teacher, I've seen this crisis further expose the inequality that our students and their families endure under capitalism at large. And like Shama pointed out, a lot of this is disproportionately towards people of color. Students haven't had technology during distance learning, access to high speed Internet, food, child care and all of these things. And just like we know homelessness is a problem for adults in the city, we also can see this with preschool to 12th grade students. The office of the superintendent last year recorded that nearly 3,000 students that we know of in Seattle public schools were homeless. And with what's going on right now with the pandemic and with the economic recession that is likely a depression, millions have filed for unemployment. And I fear that number of homeless students will rise after the moratorium evictions is up. Meanwhile, at the same time, Jeff Bezos's personal wealth between mid-March and mid-May went up almost $35 billion, and Amazon is bringing in about $11,000 a second. The state's response to all of this so far has Governor Inslee actually proposing $465 million budget cut, including $116 million from school counselors and $50 million from a fund to fight climate change. And so this very much points to the urgent urgency to taxing big business, to massively expand, you know, rent controlled, publicly controlled, affordable housing, upgrade tens of thousands of existing homes to meet Green New Deal standards and create and support thousands of good union jobs. Taxing Amazon is an issue of housing, of jobs and safety, and all of this is linked to education justice. Students all the way from preschool to college should not have to worry about finding an affordable place to live. And a victory here, like Summer was talking about, alongside the victory in Portland, really could reverberate around the country as establishment politicians and corporations are trying to get working people to pay for this crisis. But this movement can actually point towards another solution, making big business pay. So thank you so much, and I look forward to the discussion. Next, we're going to have Mama Fatuma, a resident of D1, um, a community organizer in West Seattle's High Point community since 2017. Thank you. And before that, an organizer at Yesler Terrace and a leader in the East African, Ameri uh, East African community in Seattle. 
the people that we don't speak English very well. We don't know where to go. We don't know where to do. They say stay home. We stay home. And then you don't know where our next meal come from. On top of that, the people, they don't know where, where, <clears throat> where they go tomorrow. What way they bait the house, well, whoever live in the house, they don't know how they bait the house. Because t now two months, everybody stay home. Uh, I think it's a good idea to text Amazon to help the people near it. And uh, they don't know where to go. And uh, we have kids. Uh, my English is too, be, uh, too poor, and I'm very sorry. I just made, and I speak with uh, my community, and um, with Adam, we organize, we're ready to text Amazon with my community. I'm just talking about, I speak about our community. I speak for my community. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Jennifer Hall, who is a resident of D1 and a local special education teacher at West Seattle High School. Thank you. Um, and member of the Seattle Educator Association, which has endorsed Tax Amazon, which is great. Yes, thank you, Summer. I'm very proud of my um, representative assembly and the Seattle Education Association that uh, they voted 84% at the last representative assembly to, to tax, to support the tax Amazon movement. And I was a, a little bit um, doubtful because when we've had progressive new business items before, sometimes they've been voted down because you know you do have some conservative members of the association. But I think that the reason it passed this time and, and passed with a relatively high number of votes is that as educators and educational employees, we're seeing firsthand what the effect is on our students of poverty, of to toxic capitalism, of all of a sudden having their rents increasing and having to move south and still taking buses and cabs to come to West Seattle High School because they wanna graduate and coming in without having had breakfast and being hungry and not knowing when they're going to eat again. Um, we, we see this. And right now, as we reach out to our, our students who, who um, may not have tech, we are trying to get them all tech and it's taking a while. That's an equity issue right there. When we reach out, we hear from the parents that they don't have those basic supplies that, um, that keep them feeling good and feeling dignified like laundry detergent and dish soap and uh, things to sanitize the house with. We've, we've heard a fair amount of desperation as we educators become kind of like social workers at this time. Um, I, I um, really am thankful to, um, to Shama and, uh, and everyone who's worked for the talk, uh, Tax Amazon initiative. And I think that that um, I wanna piggyback on uh, what Joe said about those students who do, don't have access to, to tech. There are a lot of them. And uh, my personal feeling about Amazon is that the Seattle School District spends so much money getting everything from Amazon. And uh, we, have, we have people of privilege. I see uh, people in my neighborhood ordering, ordering from Amazon all the time. I see the, the trucks pulling up. And uh, it's, not like, it's not like taxing them is going to break them. Bezos is still going to have a whole bunch of his billions. He's still going to have the big megaphone of the Washington Post. And he's still going to have a bunch of, of, um, of employees to, that are ununionized and and that's another thing that we have to work on because because uh, Amazon is the epitome of um, a toxic capitalist corporation it's a it's a monopoly or practically a monopoly and and it's time for us to stop uh, this this um, terrible situation that we have ha happening with our students and with uh, poor people and with everyone in Seattle because I mean I'm gonna 
retire at some point soon and be be among those um, people who are without a lot of stuff. It's it's time to to uh, not have a regressive tax system anymore. My name is Zoe Sandstead. I'm a family medicine resident physician at UW and the vice president of the UWHA, which is an independent labor union for the residents and fellows of UW. I live in the sixth district. Uh, we work all over Seattle, Harborview, um, UW, um, but I'm mostly a primary care doctor in Northgate. And I'm joining this call today in solidarity with my colleagues at UW, um, including many resident physicians who live paycheck to paycheck and who are rent burdened, and my patients who deserve better. All healthcare workers know that good health is determined by more than just biology and medicine. As a primary care doctor, the biggest obstacles to keeping my patients healthy are not a lack of medical expertise or technology. Housing insecurity and homelessness, food insecurity, the lack of access to healthy food, high cost of prescription medications, low income and the high cost of living in Seattle, and employer-based health insurance plans with high premiums and co-pays are all huge obstacles to my patients staying healthy. This was true before COVID, but is even more true during this crisis. Many of my patients have lost their insurance due to being laid off, have less ability to exercise, less access to healthy food, face eviction and homelessness more than ever before. My patients cannot afford their medications, which often cost hundreds of dollars a month. Seattle has never invested enough in combating these social determinants of health, but I was hopeful that if there was any silver lining to the COVID crisis, it could be that more attention would be paid to these systemic inequities and serious problems with our healthcare system and our unjust society. I hoped that even more people being affected by these issues and more seriously would help bring to light these problems and cause people to work harder to fix them. But instead, due to a global economic crisis, it seems that there is less funding than ever to put towards fixing these problems. All the while, billionaires get richer. We must reverse our regressive tax code to help our patients. And this crisis doesn't just affect our patients, but our healthcare workers as well. As healthcare workers, residents are on the front lines of the fight against COVID. UWHA members have been taking care of patients in the COVID ICUs, acute care wards, and emergency rooms at Harborview, UWMC, and the VA hospital. Dozens of our members, including myself, were redeployed to cover extra shifts caring for COVID patients without hazard pay. Even before COVID, nearly half of all Seattle renters struggled to pay rent, including many of our residents and other healthcare staff. Before COVID, physicians at my clinic were already sounding the alarm that our medical assistants and other frontline staff were not paid enough to survive. Medical assistants and other staff at UW, as well as residents, are paid far below the standard for their job categories. Over the holidays, we had a food drive and ended up donating the collected food to members of our own staff because there were people who were struggling and needy even within our own UW medicine community. And now UW is furloughing around 5,500 employees, all the while our hospital CEO, Dr. Paul Ramsey, takes home a high six-figure salary. Big companies tell us that this is a difficult financial time for them. In our current negotiation sessions with UW, we actually just had Dr. Tim Dellett join us today and tell us all about how they have no more money to increase our pay to a fair wage during COVID or to provide hazard pay. What they miss is that this is a global economic crisis for all people, for the workers, not for the corporations. The people of Seattle, including our healthcare workers and our patients need relief and we need it now. Seattle has the responsibility to acknowledge the institutional injustices it's allowed to perpetuate and do something about them. We must tax big companies to provide the services that our community needs that affect our health. Affordable and supportive housing, investments in Green New Deal programs will protect our environment and emergency COVID aid. Next, we have John Burbank a resident of D6, uh, actually my neighbor, one of my neighbors, and an exec the executive director of the Economic Opportunity Institute, an independent public policy organization that has for years, decades, led the fight for progressive taxation in Washington state, and also for protections for our residents. Uh, one of the biggest, uh, most recent uh, battles that they won was getting state paid family leave that was decades in the making. So thank you, John. Well, thank you very much, Summer, for, for inviting me to be on this panel. And thank you to Shama, especially for her leadership for progressive taxation. And I want to remind everyone that Shama was uh, one of the catalytic leaders for Seattle's income tax and the affluent 
uh, which ended up um, not going as we thought it would all the way to the Supreme Court, but getting stuck at the Court of Appeals level. And their Court of Appeals decision really opened up the avenue for progressive taxation in uh, the city of Seattle, giving the city uh, essentially carte blanche to uh, put together taxes, uh, progressive taxes. And that is sort of the background for what we can do uh, this year in this pandemic immediately. I'm gonna uh, go through uh, some facts and figures. Isn't it time to tax pandemic profiteers? I, th I think it is. So first of all, we have this awful problem uh, because we are uh, a country that's completely dominated by corporate capitalists. We don't have universal health coverage. We don't have universal paid leave standards, which we do in Washington state now. We don't have strong public support for child care, and we don't have a strong regulatory regulatory or, or social insurance system. Um, and that is not just something that happens. It's made possible by policy choices but that have been made by mainstream um, uh, politicians. And these politicians have perpetuated the growing income inequality in our country, the tax breaks for the wealthy and disinvestments for uh, in people and in infrastructure They've cultivated in doing this a distrust of government and and also uh, really um, honed in or developed even further institutional racism and anti-immigrant policies and a culture that enables incredibly violent racist acts like happened in Minnesota uh, just on Monday. Um, but they also have result. This also results in actual rising income inequality. So as you can see here, up between after uh, the World War, after World War II, up until 1973, the there's pretty much even Stephen in terms of the share of in, income growth was about 46% for the top 1% and about 46% for the bottom 99%, which means that everyone was enjoying a certain increase, more or less even increase in income. But look what happened after 1973. The top 1%, their income grew by 272%. And the bottom 99%, and that includes a lot of families with incomes as much as 400 or 500,000, 1,000, that only grew 34%. And since the Great Recession, we can see that the income for the top 1% uh, increased by more than half while it barely budged for everyone else. Um, one of the reasons, and, and this is then sort of doubled down in our state with having the most regressive tax system of any state. So when you calculate how much people pay in terms of state and local taxes, we find that the bottom 20% of, of families pay 18% of their income in state and local taxes, and the top 1% percent pay three percent, which means that the people in the bottom 20 percent essentially have to work until mid-March to pay their state and local taxes, while the people in the top one percent are all done in about the second week in January. Uh, and what it also means is our reliance on the sales tax and the B&O tax and the property tax means that we can't recover from recessions uh, with uh, public revenue very quickly. So if you see at the bottom here, our 2007-2009 our recession, it took five years to get per capita personal income back up to what it had been, but it took 11 years to get taxable sales back up to what it had been. Um, and that means um, that, that we, uh, this is what happened. 64,000 people lost health coverage, 180,000 people lost dental, vision, podiatry, and other services, 120,000 faced drastically reduced preventative mental health services, 50,000 low-income seniors lost assistance covering prescriptions, uh, 40,000 seniors and people with disabilities had cuts in um, and cuts and 46,000 women lost family planning, planning services. So you can see this is really det detrimental and across the board cuts happen. So 23,000 families lost TANF, QAW tuition increased by 75%, uh, 145,000 students were denied state need grants, 
um, uh, parks was cut, uh, parks funding was cut 90%. And you had thousands of school employees and other public students who lost these jobs. Now, this did not have to be the case. The legislature and the governor at that time agreed to put in place austerity budgets, cutting all public services. They could have done something else. They could have raised progressive taxes and saved those services, but they chose not to. And as a result, the recession was deeper and longer than it needed to be. And frankly, a lot of the public services like childcare and higher education have not returned to what they were pre-2009, even just before the COVID pandemic started. So what about the COVID pandemic? Well, um, as you can see, uh, these are UI claims. It's phenomenal. It's awful. Um, and this is because most of our health care is tied to our employment. This is the increase in, un, in um, lost health coverage uh, for uh, people. So now we're actually, the latest figures are we're over a million people who do not have health insurance. One out of every seven people does not have any health insurance in our state at the present time. Uh, and in terms of who's getting laid off and losing their jobs, it really hits the working class. So we can see here that 77% of people with incomes less than $25,000 have lost their jobs. 74% of people between 35,000 and 50,000 have lost their jobs. When you get up to the $200,000 level, it's, it's a quarter of those people. So who's taking the brunt of this? It's the, it's the working class people uh, who are uh, below the median income. Uh, but who's benefiting? That's the real question. Who is benefiting? Well, Jeff Bezos is benefiting. As you can see, in March on March 18th, his net worth was $113 billion. Billion dollars. May 19th, it was $147 billion. So his wealth grew by $34.6 billion in two months. And you can see the same thing happened with a little bit less, less of a growth through Bill Gates. And I can tell you it happened with uh, Steve Ballmer and Mackenzie Bezos and uh, the 10 other billionaires in our state. Uh, if you take all uh, the billionaires, you see that this tremendous growth over uh, the last um, two months of $434 billion. They are certainly the profiteers from the pandemic. And here's another profiteer from the pandemic. It's Amazon. Their stock price went up uh, by more than 25% since uh, January 1st. So they are, again, another pandemic profiteer. Uh, and people say, well, you know, what about Amazon? They do good stuff. Well, you know, they Amazon is a real taker. The reason they're a taker, one of the reasons they're a taker is because of their, as someone else mentioned, their monopolistic practices. Uh, but another is that they actually take money from the state government. And with this graph, you can see that over the last six years, they have taken over $225 million from the state government. That's what they do. They look for a tax exemption, they grab it, they take it, and uh, they, they extract money from the state that could be going to public services. Um, and this is how one of the reasons how one of the ways Amazon works its magic in the legislature. Uh, I think you all probably heard about this workforce education bill that passed last year that was to design to provide free uh, public higher education for very low income people and reduced uh, costs for tuition for people up to uh, about $70,000 of, of income. Well, that sounded all good. And it was going to be funded uh, by a surtax of 1.22% on um, the large advanced computing businesses like Amazon and Microsoft. And in fact, they got a lot of headlines for saying, oh, tax us. We want you to tax us so we can supply higher education for the people of our state. If you read through the bill, you come to this sentence. In no case will the combined surcharge imposed under this subsection paid by all members of an affiliated group be more than $9 million annually. 
So that makes makes it that basically that makes the surcharge probably about 0.001%, not 0.12%. Uh, and the reason that's in there is that Amazon essentially blackmailed the legislature and said, you have to put this in here, or we're gonna rearrange our business practices. So uh, you're going to lose his taxes. Well, the legislature should have stood up to him and said, screw that. You know, we're going to keep this in there and uh, we're going to make sure that you can't mess around with your tax status. But it didn't. And this is what we get. Anyway, that's a little bit about Amazon. We have an opportunity to to tax Amazon in a progressive manner. Uh, we should also be looking at, at, at taxing the uh, compensation decisions of other employers uh, in the state that are uh, uh, compensating people above uh, two hundred and fifty thousand or three hundred thousand. There's no reason why we we people should be um, employers should be encouraged to pay that compensation in the middle of pandemic when people are li literally losing their homes and don't have uh, the money to purchase food. Um, we could also institute a one percent income tax which uh, the legislatures did do. But these things are not in necessary competition with each other. They're in their complementary. And what we need to do, and we're going to actually need all the revenues that can be brought in from, say, two, all three of these measures uh, in order to provide the public services that people should expect from a true democracy. So let's make sure we have universal health coverage, that we uh, have we say no to its austerity, that we rebuild our economy, that we build a new world from the ashes of COVID, and that we tax Amazon. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for giving us the great image of tax Amazon as the phoenix that can rise from the ashes here. And especially thank you also for bringing up the concept of corporate welfare because that is that is truly what is going on here in Washington State and in Seattle. Um, in Washington State alone, we have over 700 tax breaks for major corporations and wealthy individuals, and that is more than any other state other than the state of New York. So we really stand alone in a terrible way there, um, and we need, we need to fix that. Next, we have Erin Cote, who is with 350. Seattle. She's a White Center resident, an organizer in 350 Seattle's Big Businesses Tax Team. She's a former school teacher at Evergreen High School, and she's a science educator. Thank you, Erin. So uh, in my professional life, I'm a science educator, and I'm here today as an organizer for climate justice. A common thread through both of these roles is helping people understand the connections between things that are not obvious at first glance. This legislation is so important because it does this just that. It addresses multiple interconnected crises at once. The crises that I'm talking about are, of course, the longstanding affordability crisis in Seattle, which has been exacerbated by the current economic and health crises of the novel coronavirus. And finally, the climate crisis, which has been looming over us for decades. We know that in all three of these cases, it is low income and communities of color which are most affected. This proposed legislation ensures it is these same communities who will be at the center of the solutions to these challenges. The novel coronavirus has disrupted nearly every part of our lives. Though incredibly challenging, it has also left us with an opportunity to radically change our city. We've seen across the country acceptance of ideas which have long been politically impossible. And so this is the time for bold and innovative solutions to problems that we have allowed to fester for far too long. This legislation provides immediate relief to struggling Seattleites and puts us on the path of building the Seattle we want to live in. The city council has already committed to making the Green New Deal a reality for our city. And this proposal is a first step in living up to that commitment. It would create thousands of affordable homes and transition tens of thousands of homes off fossil fuels all while creating about 16,000 well-paid jobs in just the first five years. This is the promise of the Green New Deal, using infrastructure and job creation to create a healthier, more resilient, more equitable world. In Seattle, the largest sources of carbon emissions are from transportation and from buildings that run on natural gas. Increasing our density of green and affordable housing both reduces building emissions and reduces the need for people to commute into the city thereby addressing both of these sources of carbon pollution at the same time. 
The funds to build a new Seattle must come from those who can afford it. We currently have a shameful tax system where those who can least afford it pay the most in taxes. We need to address these crises, but we cannot continue to tax working people to do so. It would also be morally objectionable to implement austerity and prolong the economic effects of this pandemic. A progressive tax on big business is the, only, is the most effective and most equitable way to fund Seattle's recovery. There is a lot of wealth in this city and it's time we start leveraging it. We have an incredible opportunity to be a leader for the nation. We've been a leader in shutting down early and combating this virus. And we now can be a leader in the economic recovery and transition away from fossil fuels and towards a more equitable world. Thank you very much for letting me speak today. And I urge our council members to take bold action to provide relief to our communities and build a better Seattle. I'm Kathy Heffernan. And I am a resident of District 1. I have been here in West Seattle for the better part of the 30 years that I have lived in Seattle. And I just want to share um, a story where the crisis, uh, affordability crisis in Seattle has um, impacted me. Um, I have watched our city change from one with working class roots to one in which a big corporation, Amazon, unapologetically tries to buy a city council election. In 2015, I experienced this unaffordability when I received a rent increase, one rent increase of 130%. My rent went up from $1,000 a month to $2,300 a month. That was one rent increase, completely legal. That same year, um, Mayor Murray declared a um, housing emergency, declared an emergency on homelessness. But in five years, little has been done. And today we face a crisis of unprecedented proportions in our lifetime with COVID-19. Not only a healthcare crisis, but an affordability crisis and an unemployment crisis. Things I have been just astounded at, um, as Shama mentioned before, 100,000 people have now died from this disease in this country that is more deaths than those um, who died in the Korean and Vietnam wars. Uh, regarding unemployment, several people have already mentioned this. It's worth mentioning again, um, Federal Reserve Chairman Jer Jerome Powell said that we will hit 25% unemployment by the end of June. And this is a, a chilling, a very chilling thought because um, during the Great Depression, unemployment reached 24.9% by 1933, over three years after the crash of the stock market. We are nearing this unemployment rate after only three months. As a union member of SEIU 1199, I have been appalled at um, the healthcare system that I work for, University of Washington Medical Center. Um, we had to bargain for our contract when COVID started, when the coronavirus started to rage through the hospitals. And um, according to our bargaining team, the University of Washington Medical Center was probably the worst healthcare system um, to bargain with in the entire state. Um, give you some examples of what we had to fight for. A lot of um, our coworkers in other hospitals were given a $10 increase in their wage for being redeployed. We had to fight for an additional $4. Uh, University of Washington also wanted us to, um, if we were being redeployed from the Northwest campus to Montlake, we had to pay, uh, pay for parking there, even if we were paying for monthly parking up at Northwest. So we got them to lift the gates so everybody could park and not worry about it during this crisis. And, um, we also had to fight for two weeks of paid administrative leave if we got COVID and management wanted to prove somehow that we got it at the hospital and not in the community. So, which is impossible to try and um, figure out. So we won two weeks paid administrative leave and our, we had to fight, we had to fight for this. And that's the only way when we know that's the only way that we can win is when we fight and we fight together. So, um, the sad thing, of course, is that as several people have said, um, 4,000 people are going to be, or I think somebody said 5,500, which is probably the more accurate count now, um, healthcare workers are going to be furloughed. 
and after being called essential workers for the last for the last two months. And many of my coworkers are bracing themselves now for permanent layoffs. And if that happens, we will join the ranks of more than 38 million Americans who have applied for unemployment. As many have mentioned, while working people are furloughed and lose jobs and health care and can't afford their rent or their mortgage. The wealth of US billionaires has surged $434 billion, which is an increase of 15%, pretty good raise. And Amazon's Jeff Bezos is set to become the world's first trillionaire. And he's made approximately $34 billion himself during this pandemic. Clearly, there is just no excuse. Clearly, big business can afford to pay a modest tax of 1.3%, modest tax of 1.3% to fund COVID emergency assistance, long-term affordable social housing, and the Green New Deal. This tax would provide immediate cash assistance to up to 100,000 vulnerable households. This tax is crucial and directly addresses the emergency that we face right now. With the implementation of this tax, again, up to 100,000 will receive cash assistance. So the central question facing Seattle, as many other panelists have pointed out, who's gonna pay for the COVID crisis? Big business or working people who are struggling already before this crisis? The choice should be clear, but as Noam Chomsky said recently, quote, the logic of capitalism is lethal, unquote. The logic of capitalism has created in the first place a healthcare system that makes money off of people being sick, off of people suffering. The logic of capitalism means billionaires make money off the suffering of ordinary people during a pandemic. We need to stop this crazy making. The council needs to pass the Sawant Morales Amazon tax without watering it down. So our city council members who aren't here with us ordinary folks today, I ask, which side are you on? <laughs>